Hey guys, today we're talking about the Federalist era, and this is a chunky portion of period three. Um, the Federalist era stretches from 1789 to 1801, and it encompasses um, George Washington and John Adams' administrations, but a whole lot more than that. So we're going to start talking about domestic policy, and when I mean domestic, I mean what's going on at home on U.S. soil with our brand new nation that is now under the Constitution. Um, so essentially, oh goodness, um, essentially the population is nearly 4 million um, in 1790 was the first American census and we're seeing that it's going to double about every 25 years because lots of immigrants are coming to the United States. It's still a very rural um, feel in the United States. So with 90% of Americans living on farms, we're going to see more people move out west um, and to claim their own farmland. And so Vermont, Kentucky, Tennessee, and Ohio are going to be our next few states, uh, with Kentucky being established as a state in 1792. Um, Essentially, the finances of the entire country are teetering on the edge of disaster. Um, public debt was enormous. Both state and national government, remember, under the Articles of Confederation, had different currencies, and all of those currencies were essentially worthless paper money um, in heavy circulation. And uh, an overarching feeling of this could end in disaster is spreading through the country as well. In 12 years, America had overthrown their British government and had overthrown their Articles of Confederation government. Um, and so we're going to see foreign challenges as well, um, Britain and Spain kind of threatening the unity of the United States. Um, so George Washington is going to be our first president. He was unanimously like drafted, like NFL drafted, um, by the Electoral College in 1789. Not a elector voted against him. Um, he's the only president to be unanimously voted into office. Um, so essentially, on April 30th, 1789, he's going to take office, and his office is in New York City. There is not an official capital yet, and so this unofficial temporary um, capital will be George will be in New York City, and John Adams is going to be seen as the um, vice president. Okay. So Washington's cabinet. Essentially, um, this is not in the Constitution. The president and the executive branch um, did not have this power written in the Constitution. It's just something that George Washington did that became a precedent. And so the consulting of cabinet members or making them department heads of the bureaucracy um, in order to make better decisions is a Washington idea that we still have today. Um, Essentially, it becomes an unwritten constitution. There are things, this is just one of them, that Washington does that now other presidents do because he set the precedent, um, not exactly because they were in the constitution, like a cabinet, like um, own, stopping your presidency after two terms. And so he establishes... Um, a cabinet, and essentially there's only like three full-fledged department heads at this time. We have Secretary of State, Thomas Jefferson, Secretary of the Treasury, Alexander Hamilton, Secretary of War, Henry Knox, and then um, later on we're, um, Washington is going to appoint Edmund Randolph as the Attorney General, um, and that will be the fourth major cabinet member after the passage of the Judiciary Act of 1789, which we're going to get to. But essentially what will plague this cabinet is the constant bickering and fighting between Thomas Jefferson, who was originally an anti-federalist and will become a Democratic Republic and that Republican, that part of that political party, him versus Alexander Hamilton, who is a federalist through and through. So the first issue of the federalist era is one that we talked more about um, when we discussed the framing of the Constitution, and that is the addition of the Bill of Rights. It's one of the first priorities facing the new government. Essentially, anti-federalists had criticized the Constitution because of the lack of a Bill of Rights, saying that without a Bill of Rights, the federal government can infringe on state and individual rights. And many states had ratified the Constitution only if the Bill of Rights was 
would be later included um, in, in one of those states, one of the major players being Virginia that did that. Um, and so to add a Bill of Rights, they needed to amend the Constitution. Here's how they had written in how they could amend the Constitution when they wrote the Constitution. Um, a, a constitutional convention requested by the states, um, that has never happened, or a two-thirds vote by both houses of Congresses, both houses of Congress, and a ratification by three-fourths of the states in our nation, and that has happened on um, multiple different occasions, the Bill of Rights being the beginning of that. So the Bill of Rights is the first 10 amendments, and essentially I've included this little cartoon. I'm going to breeze through them really quick. So. Um, your First Amendment rights are freedom, religion, press, assembly, and petition. Second Amendment rights bear arms. Third Amendment, the quartering of soldiers. Fourth Amendment, um, lawful protection against unwanted search and seizure. The Fifth Amendment is um, the rights of persons accused of crimes. Number six, um, the rights of persons on trial for crimes. So uh, a speedy and just trial. Number seven, jury trials in civil cases. So trial by jury. Eight, limitations on bail and cruel and unusual punishment. Um, amendment nine would be the rights, individuals' um, rights kept to the people. So like non-delegated rights going to individuals. Um, essentially saying the Bill of Rights can't list everything, but uh, here's some rights that uh, you can get even if they're not expressly stated. And then the last one, powers kept by the states if not expressly stated in the Constitution. Um, so after the Bill of Rights has been passed, um, essentially there are more things, not amendments per se, but more federal laws that need to be passed in order to establish a um, government that will be successful, including establishing more of a judiciary branch. So essentially the uh, Supreme Court was written into the Constitution and kind of just left there. And the federal government uh, realized that there needed to be more organization within the Supreme Court and thus the Judiciary Act of 1789. It organizes the Supreme Court with a chief justice and then five associates, six justices total, and that has since been added on to. Um, it also organized federal district and federal circuit courts. Um, did I have that on there? Yeah, I think so. <laughs> and then um, established the Office of Attorney General that Edmund Randolph will fill in presidents in the president's cabinet. Um, essentially. The law in the Judiciary Act stated the Supreme Court could force presidential appointments of judges, um, and that is a power that the uh, executive branch has, a power to appoint judges, and the check and balance system ensures that those judges are then approved by the Senate in the legislative branch. So Washington Secretary of the Treasury, Alexander Hamilton, during this time period is researching and um, is a very intelligent man to begin with and begins to put together a financial plan for the United States of America as Secretary of the Treasury. His beginning ideas he wrote down in these two documents on your screen um, and on the bottom left there that's a um, rendition of him that you might find familiar because it's on your $10 bill and on the bottom right that is Lin-Manuel Miranda the um, author and star of the hit Broadway musical Hamilton um, so on the left is what he actually looks like on the right is what I like to picture him as because I love that musical so these two documents were the report on public credit and the report on manufacturers so on um, the report on public credit essentially was a plan to shape the financial policies in the United States to favor the wealthy in the sense of if we favor the wealthy, then later on the wealthy can help us out monetarily and support the federal government and them creating um, better businesses will create jobs for the lower classes, kind of like a trickle-down wealth idea. The second one is the report on manufacturers in 1791. Um, that is advocating the factory system in the United States. And the reason behind this is so that Americans would then buy American goods instead of buying foreign goods. And, and to strengthen the idea of capitalism, we can make it into the business, we just got to um, be able to manufacture things. And the report on manufacturers is going to be the basis for um, the tariff component, and the tariff is a tax on imports in his financial plan later. Um, because tariffs, um, export tariffs and import tariffs, can raise money for the federal government, which he will put into his financial plan. So um, there are 
five main components of Hamilton's financial plan. And the first one is the most confusing. It's called funding at par. And the idea of funding at par is to um, increase national credit, make the U.S. look credible on the world stage financially. Um, because the government can't borrow money from other governments or from wealthy citizens without the investors, other governments or the wealthy citizens being confident in America's ability to pay it back. And so essentially, um, funding at par urged Congress to pay off the entire national debt um, and to assume other debts occurred, incurred by the states um, that had been incurred during the Revolutionary War through the selling of bonds. So government bonds had been sold to fund the Revolutionary War. That's essentially they sell a piece of paper that says the money will multiply with interest, um, in due time in the government, you can sell that bond later um, during a government buyback or if someone um, wants to buy that bond from you, essentially. So bonds had actually depreciated during the Articles of Confederation period because of the terrible economy. Um, and so speculators still had large amounts of bonds. Many wealthy investors had bought up a bunch of bonds knowing what Hamilton's plan was going to be, while many original bondholders, like common people who had helped to fund the Revolutionary War, had already sold them unknowingly, um, thinking the government was too poor or unable to buy them back during the Articles of Confederation period. And though, and so they were desperate for cash, essentially, and sold them off. If they had just held out until Hamilton's financial plan went through, they would have made more money. Um, and Hamilton was kind of criticized at this point for not alerting the original bondholders to hold on to their bonds. Um, because of the eventual government, federal government buyback of those bonds, which really benefited the wealthy and hurt the common people. The second part of Hamilton's financial plan is the assumption of state debts. This is where the federal government takes the debt of the states as its own. Now, states were in debt due to the Revolutionary War and the bad economy of the Articles of Confederation, in debt to individuals, in debt to other countries, in debt to other states. And so um, the underlying motive of this was if the federal government takes the state's debts, then the states are obligated to the federal government. They um, owe them a like moral debt, essentially, um, to be loyal to the federal government. And so um, Hamilton believed that national debt was a blessing that would cement the union um, and give them a good line of credit, essentially. Um, and so states with no debt really liked this, really hated this plan because states with debt really liked it. Like Massachusetts owed individuals in other countries bunches of money. And so they're like, yeah, you can take our debt, you go for it. Whereas Virginia, who had sold a lot of um, crops in order to pay off their debt and were essentially debt free, really didn't like the idea of paying taxes and their tax money going towards paying off another state debt. Um, and so the way that this deal was passed um, was through a process called log rolling. And log rolling is where two opposing factions, so the people that say, yes, we should assume state, debt, state debts, and no, we shouldn't, agree to vote for each other's bills so that their cherished bill will pass. So here was the, um, the debate here. Um, Virginians wanted to move the uh, capital from New York City to Virginia. And so the South wanted that, and the South were the ones that didn't have any debt, whereas the North, um, like Massachusetts, for example, wanted their debts to be assumed by the federal government. So they voted for each other's bills in Congress, log rolling, and both passed. And so the federal government assumed state debts, and now Washington, D.C. would be in the Virginia area, which is actually more like Maryland, but in the Virginia area, and it would be called the District of Columbia, and that federal district would be in the South. Um, Madison and Jefferson are instrumental in helping up set up this compromise. Thomas Jefferson himself like set up the um, arrangement, I assume, and Hamilton um, was uh, um, essential in getting it passed as well. And Actually, he got the better end of the deal because they just like, it doesn't matter where the capital ends up, essentially. It's still the capital. It is still very um, different than 
the area that it's in. It has nothing to do with whether it's in the north or the south. It's its own entity and has always been. And so Hamilton really got the better end of this deal. He just lost where the capital was, which didn't matter, but he got the assumption of state debts. That is all outlined in one of my favorite Hamilton songs ever. It's called The Room Where It Happens, and you should definitely go listen to it. I might even play it in class. All right. Three more parts of Hamilton's financial plan. The third part is the idea of tariffs or customs duties, so taxes on imports. And those have become a source of revenue for paying off that debt that, that was assumed um, from the states. And so uh, tariffs revenues really depend on foreign trade. We need to be on the world stage trading so that um, people buy our goods and so that we buy their goods as well. It's like a reciprocal process. However, the secondary goal of this is to help protect infant industries. We have these fledgling manufacturers in the United States who are just now getting up on their feet. Um, and so to protect those people, you put a tariff on goods coming into the United States so it's more expensive to buy things from other countries and cheaper to buy things from the United States. So they're going to put the first tariff law passed in U.S. history at the national level is an 8% tariff on imports. The fourth part of Hamilton's plan is an excise tax. Sometimes nowadays an excess excise tax is called a sin tax, and it's taxes on goods bought and sold within our country, mostly on things that people want. So nowadays, it's gasoline and cigarettes. Um, in 1791, Hamilton wants an excise tax on domestic items, including whiskey, and um, his plan is to tax it at seven cents per um, a gallon, and this is really going to hurt the um, backcountry farmers, essentially, that use whiskey as an ulterior income. Um, and whiskey was so popular during this time period and worth a lot of money, so much so that when paper money became um, super inflated and not worth a lot of money, sometimes people would use whiskey as money. That's how valuable and how held in esteem it was um, in this time period in, the, in America in the 1790s. Hamilton's not super concerned with the fact that it's making the backcountry men angry because he knows that most of them are anti-federalist in sentiment to begin with. So the most controversial part of this whole plan was the Bank of the United States. And from here on out, you might hear me call it the BUS, the B-U-S, Bank of the United States. So this is going to be the point of contention between Hamilton and Jefferson that breaks, essentially breaks Washington's cabinet in half. So um, the provisions of a Bank of the United States would B, that the government is a major stockholder in the bank, and there's even private stock within the bank. Um, and so not only is the government a stockholder in the bank and wants it to succeed, but also individual wealthy citizens wanting it to su su succeed. The federal treasury would deposit its surplus money in the bank. That gives the federal government a safe place to store their money. It gives the nation lots of money in circulation that's backed by the federal government. And it also gives the power... Um, for the government to print a unified currency, providing a sound, a sound and stable national currency, unlike what we had under the Articles of Confederation. There's another great Hamilton song about this one. Um, if you want to go listen to it, um, I can send you that link there. So essentially, Jefferson strongly, strongly opposes the bank. And that is because Jefferson is anti-federalist in sentiment and a very strict constructionist. And here's what that means. Um, strict constructionist means that they look at the Constitution the way it is directly written. And the Constitution does not say that there should be a national bank. And so he argues um, that a national bank cannot be put into place, that the, the interest of it is not in the interest of the nation and it is in the Constitution, so it can't be done. Jefferson and Madison would be considered um, strict constructionists. On the other side, we have Hamilton. Um, Hamilton argued that the Constitution produces, um, I'm sorry, supports a plan for a national bank because he broadly interprets the Constitution. He constructs it, constructs it, he views it in a loose manner. Um, and he sees this, the need for the national bank through the elastic clause um, that provided for any passing of laws that are necessary and proper um, to carry out the powers vested in the various governmental agencies is a direct quote, also known as implied powers of Congress. So 
not everything can be expressly written in the Constitution would be a loose constructionist um, argument. And thus, the Necessary and Proper Clause gives the Congress implied powers to enact things because this document needs to grow and change and be a living document that's going to last generations. So concerning the National Bank itself, Jefferson and Madison argue that it would benefit the wealthy at expense of the farmers, that state banks wouldn't able to compete with the power of a national bank, um, and Jefferson and Madison are very states' rights, and the federal government, they said that the federal government will enjoy the surplus of funds um, at the expense of those paying into the bank with taxes. Um, whereas Hamilton and other loose constructionists would argue that a bank is necessary necessary and proper to store um, collection of taxes and money from the regulation of trade, um, from tariffs, all of which those things, that would be the power of the federal government to regulate commerce. So that's how they justify the National Bank. Washington reluctantly signs the bank measure into law. He calls for Hamilton and Jefferson to both write down their arguments. We have those documents. Um, but essentially, Hamilton's view prevailed over Jefferson's because of the economic distress that happened under the Articles of Confederation. And now we have this plan, hey, maybe it's going to work. Um, and so this north-south friction where the northern wealthier Federalists versus the southern states' rights anti-Federalists that will eventually become Democratic Republicans starts resurfacing again. And the bank issue opens this public debate on what does the Constitution say about the things that we're doing in our new nation. So this excise tax is put into place in 1791 and um, the southern Pennsylvania and southern, um, sorry, western Virginia backcountry folks are really, really hit hard by this um, excise tax that was seven cents per gallon, I believe. Um, and so we have these boys who call themselves the Whiskey Boys in southern Pennsylvania, and they are torturing buildings, tarring and feathering revenue officers, chasing government supporters away from their region. Um, and some of them were even talking about seceding from the United States and causing another revolution over a whiskey tax. And so tax collections actually come to a screeching halt, and the federal government is not making money off this excise tax. Um, and here's where we see the power of the federal government. The federal government is being challenged. Washington will rise to the occasion. Washington summoned a militia of several states, um, like forced a militia, not volunteer, like you are my states. I am the federal government. Send me men. 13,000 man army goes to southern Pennsylvania. Washington actually accompanies troops part of the way. Hamilton goes all the way with the troops, um, and they essentially chase the Whiskey Boys into the hills of western Pennsylvania, and they completely disperse. Um, the significance of this is, compare this to Shays' Rebellion under the Ar Articles of Confederation, where Washington had no power to forcibly raise an army. They had to depend on volunteers. Now he has the power to forcibly raise an army, and it shows that Washington's federal government can ensure domestic tranquility. Shays' Rebellion is not going to happen again. These little uprisings can be squashed by the federal government. Um, now, Jeffersonians would say that this action was a brutal display of force, and um, that's going to be, this is going to be part of the reason why we see political parties start splitting up. So this little quote up here um, is from a Hamilton song, but essentially this slide is going to be about the birth of the two-party system. Um, the two-party system is we have two political parties, and that's kind of the way it has been ever since this moment, 1790s in American history. We call this first two-party system the first party system, and that's very confusing. That's just because it's the first time we have solidified political parties and their ideas, and later on we're going to see those things shift around. I actually have a chart I can show you guys in class that'll make a lot more sense. So this is the first party system, and the first party system has two political parties. <laughs> so, um, original plan, the Founding Fathers in Philadelphia, the Philadelphia Convention where they wrote the Constitution, they did not envision the existence of political parties. The organized opposition seemed 
disloyal and like it was against the idea that we're coming together as a nation. There were, however, factions. Factions are not political parties. Some factions had already existed in American politics and even in British politics before, the Tories and the Whigs, the Federalists and the Anti-Federalists, but those are not political parties. We're going to see during this time period, Jefferson and Madison, they organized this faction essentially within Congress and that just to oppose Hamilton because they don't like the things that he's doing with the financial plan. And that will eventually turn into a political party, the um, Democratic Republic Party, because those ideas formed in Congress in this little like faction party bowl here um, drew support from the American public and thus would become a political party. So two really well-defined groups are going to crystallize the Hamiltonian Federalists and the Jeffersonian Republicans, okay? Oh my gosh, where'd it go? So on the left here, we have Democratic Republicans, and Democratic Republicans are um, Jeffersonian in nature. They advocate the rule of the people, government for the people. Um, and so these are more common people, more Western and Southern people, mostly farmers and rurals, rurals, people that live in rural areas, and they advocate states' rights, where on Hamilton's side, we see that political party call themselves the Federalist, um, and they emerge from the Federalist faction. Most of these are Northern, wealthy, and they are um, in support of federal power. So, cute little meme here. Uh, Washington says, Thomas, what did I tell you not to do? And Jefferson says, don't create a two-party system. Washington, and what did you do? Jefferson says, create a two-party system, essentially. Um, so, here's what Federalists believe here. Um, again, they come from the Federalist faction. When we were framing this Constitution, those that wanted more power of the federal government, they believe in government by rule of the upper class with attention to the regular people, the masses. So the best people ruling, the rich having more power. And here's why. They say that the rich have more leisure to study problems and find solutions. Um, they have the advantage of intelligence, education, and culture, unlike the poor who are just trying to survive here. John Jay even says those who own the country ought to govern it. Um, another common idea of the Federalist Party is distrusting common people. Um, they thought at this time that direct democracy was mobocracy. The mob is easily able to take over and change things, and they do not like that idea. Um, they think that direct democracy leaves things that are too important up to people who are uneducated enough to make a decision about it. All right, of course, Federalists believe in a strong federal government, a strong central government to maintain law and, law and order, crush rebellions, protect life and property, mostly of the wealthy, because they are the wealthy class. They also believe economically that the federal government should um, foster business, but not interfere with it. So Federalists, essentially, they like the merchants and the manufacturers and the shippers, because most of them live in the area in the north where that's very common, and not so much an agricultural um economy like the South would favor. And finally, they're pro-British in their foreign relation policies because they see that trade with Great Britain is very key to America's economy. Great Britain is a bustling country with a great economy, and if America can beat off of that, that's what they want. Um, and so many Federalists had started out in, during the Revolutionary War as loyalists, actually. All right, in direct contrast, we have the Jeffersonians that call their political party the Democratic Republicans, and then later they just drop the Democratic and call themselves the Republicans. And this is the idea of government for the people, um, government for people that are able to educate themselves. They believe that the common people had teachable factor to them. Yes, they weren't educated, but you can educate them and thus they can make better decisions and government decisions. Um, their biggest appeal is to the middle class and to the underprivileged, essentially. Farmers, laborers, artisans, small shopkeepers are going to be people that will eventually identify as Democratic Republicans. Um, they believe that a government that governs best governs the least. So like a hands-off sort of approach, like go fight your own battles, we'll be here if you need us, sort of. Um, the bulk of power should be retained by the states. They wanted big state governments. And that is all in the Tenth Amendment. Um, that central authority was to be kept at bay, because in the Constitution, 
this is what the federal government is allowed to do, and everything else should be left to the states, as the Tenth Amendment says. None of this necessary and proper elastic clause, clause crap that um, the federalists type um, tend to um, tend to put forth. Um, they also are not a big fan of national debt. They think it's a curse to um, future generations and it should be paid off very quickly. They see themselves as mostly agrarian and they're very pro-French, unlike the Federalists who are pro-British. Oh, also, um, they believed in free speech and that free speech can expose. So concerning America on the world stage, the first big event that happens is the French Revolution. And the significance of the French Revolution to American history is that it's the single most important issue splitting Federalists from Democratic Republicans or Republicans. And so there's this upheaval in France that essentially pleases, um, initially pleases the Jeffersonian Republicans because they see the French Re Revolution as a second chapter of the American Revolution where tyranny is being overthrown and a proper government is being put into place. There's this reign of terror going on in um, France. King Louis and his wife are beheaded and anyone is subject to the guillotine for their beliefs. Um, and so Federalists are just appalled at this violence and the scope of the carnage um, whereas Jeffersonians are viewing it as it needed to happen because there was tyranny in France and it needed to be overthrown. Um, and so the French Revolution becomes a mega war. Great Britain is sucked into the conflict, and now the United States needs to decide which side are they going to support because war is eventually going to spread to the Atlantic and into the Caribbean. So how would America react to the French Revolution? Many people cry out and say, what about the Franco-American alliance? They helped us out in our revolution, um, and we are still obligated to pay them back for that. The U.S. had pledged to protect the French West Indies from enemies, um, and so the Jeffersonians favored honoring that alliance, whereas President Washington believed that war should be avoided at all costs. The military is small. Um, the country is not doing well economically. It's in a fledgling state, essentially. And so premature entry into wars would cost us money, would cost us lives, might even cost us um, our sovereignty. Um, and so Hamilton and Jefferson um, are... I'm sorry, Hamilton and Jefferson are kind of brought into this argument as well, whereas both of those players kind of agree that avoiding war is a good thing. Jeffersonians, the Democratic Republicans, are enraged when Washington um, declares neutrality in 1793. This says that the war between Britain and France, they will not fight over it, they will not get involved in the French Revolution, and it warns citizens to be impartial, to not care about what's going on with this war. Um, essentially, the Jeffersonians are enraged because Washington didn't consult Congress on this. He just dropped this statement of neutrality, neutrality, um, and they see that as um, an affront, essentially, that the executive branch is just taking over too much power in deciding whether or not to act whereas the Federalists definitely support the Neutrality Proclamation. The United States eventually ends up benefiting from neutrality because it means that the um, the United States could still trade and deliver food to the French West Indies. Um, France didn't actually call upon the U.S. to honor their agreement and come join in the war, so it wasn't um, that they were breaking any promise. And if the United States had entered the war, Great Britain, who was now sucked into this war as well, um, their navy would have blockaded American coasts and completely cut off needed supplies and trade, further crippling the nation. So these issues with Britain and France are going to bubble over into issues between the United States and Britain. And um, Jay's Treaty of 1794 does a pretty good job of alleviating um, U.S. conflict with Great Britain early on. So here's the background information for Jay's Treaty. Essentially, Great Britain had continued to menace American people on U.S. soil. They still had British troops um, stationed in the United States and on the high seas, essentially. Um, they had been violating peace treaties. The peace treaty of 1783, the um, treaty that ended the Revolutionary War by keeping their troops in the United States, they had been um, kind of poking the natives to annoy um, and not just annoy, but be violent against Americans on the frontier by selling firearms and alcohol to Native Americans in um, 
oh my gosh, what's the word? In response for Native Americans to attack American settles, settlers, so bribing them in exchange for um, attacking American settlers. And finally, that idea, that word that we learned in class the other day, impressment, and that is when the British Navy seizes um, a bunch of U.S. ships, over 300, takes the stuff, and often impresses the um, soldiers, forcing them into the British Navy and or imprisoning them. Um, and so that's why there's a need to settle disputes between the United States and Great Britain. So the opinions of this on both sides, the Federalists are unwilling to go to war because they are pro-British and trade with Great Britain is very lucrative during this time period. Um, that's where they get the bulk of their um, revenue, people buying things from Great Britain and then putting a tariff on it. It's where most American people get their goods and sell their goods as well. Um, on the other hand, Jeffersonian Republicans or Democratic Republicans argue that the U.S. should impose an embargo against George III because of all these things that he's doing and um, inciting um, economic pressure, essentially. So the solution to this is that Washington is going to send um, John Jay, the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, to London in 1794. Um, Jeffersonians are fearful that he's going to sell out. And um, Hamil Hamilton is essentially going to create a deal um, kind of sneakily that's going to make sure that that doesn't happen. So here's what Hamilton does. He wants Great Britain to be appeased because he doesn't want to start a war because he's pro-British and our economy at this point depends on the British. So he sends the bargaining strategy, the talking points that um, John Jay is going to take to this meeting to the British diplomat before John Jay even shows up. So he is very prepared and knows what how the United States is going to try and persuade him. And essentially that strategy, sneaky and awful, worked. Um, essentially the war is prevented. We don't have a war with Great Britain yet, um, but America wins very few concessions within Jay's Treaty, very few things America benefits from. Um, essentially, America does get Great Britain to renew their pledge to remove troops from um, British soil like they should have in 1783. Um, the British will consent to pay damages for the ships that they had taken, over 300 of them. Um, however, America kind of loses in this game in that um, Great Britain demands that they pay their pre-Revolutionary War debts to Great Britain, and um, the Great Britain makes absolutely no promises to stop um, inciting natives against American settlers or impressing sailors. So Great Britain being prepared for this meeting because Hamilton tipped them off, yes, it helped America in the sense that a war was not started, but it hurt America in the sense of they're not going to get a lot of the things that they wanted to get out of Jay's Treaty. And thus, war with Great Britain is going to be postponed, essentially. Um, at the time, they thought it was over. It will happen again later. So let's turn our attention to Spain, relations, foreign relations with Spain. Spain. Essentially, um, the, the Spanish fear that the British and Americans are going to gang up on them, and so they want to appease Americans and make them happy, kind of like an um, like honoring them by saying, let's give you some land, essentially, be nice to us. Spain is a declining power in Europe, um, and their position on the American frontier is getting smaller and smaller as more American colonists move out west into the land that they rightfully own, um, everything east of the Mississippi River is what they rightfully own. And so um, Pickney's Treaty is going to improve American relations with Spain, and here's what it says. Americans have free navigation of the Mississippi River, including um, whatever trade they want to do at the mouth of the river, the um, port city of New Orleans. And finally, it's going to give a large portion of Florida that had been in dispute. Um, some people thought Spain owned it. Some people thought America owned it. They finally just give it over to America. Um, and so the 31st parallel is going to be recognized as the border between U.S. and Spanish Florida. And all of that territory is going to be called Georgia for quite some time until we will get um, Mississippi and Alabama out of that land as well. Oh, so there that all is. <laughs> All right, we also have to think about Native Americans as foreign relations. Um, and so the Iroquois Nation um, had been forced onto reservations or pushed out west um, in New York and Pennsylvania after the Revolutionary War. Many of them fled to Canada. They're no longer a major threat like they were during the colonial period. However, there are a few skirmishes between um, 
natives and Americans moving out into the frontier. Native expansion is, I'm sorry, American expansion is threatening natives and that isn't an issue during the Federalist era, but it's going to be a large issue. Um, the Treaty of Greenville in 1795 is going to take a bunch, a big portion of Ohio and Indiana um, away from native tribes, pushing them out west. Um, and that's going to essentially be part of the reason that we have um, those states start to develop as well. So, can we get back to politics, please? That's another Hamilton quote. Sorry for you guys that don't like it. Um, so, essentially, Washington spends two terms. He reluctantly accepts a second term. Um, he runs for re-election again and goes uncontested. And um, his friends and advisors say, you need to run again. You're definitely going to win. He does. Um, he's unanimously re-elected again. But um, he kind of loses this nonpartisan father of our country reputation when he becomes a Federalist. He doesn't join the Federalist Party, but his ideas are so Federalist, everyone's like, yeah, Washington's part of the Federalist Party. Um, and so the Jeffersonian Democratic Republicans, they are criticizing him very much. Um, and that's why he's going to be less liked going into his second term as president. Um, he's physically exhausted. He's a little bit older now. Um, he's being verbally abused by um, Democratic Republicans who don't agree with what he's doing. And so um, after his second term, he decides to step down. This is not in the Constitution. This is something that he decided to do. And it ended up setting a precedent. All other presidents, not all, but um, most other presidents will um, only uh, serve two terms and then leave the office um, of the president. And that will not become a law until after FDR in 1945, where a president can only serve two terms. Um, essentially, the position was set up to be kind of like a pseudo king. They can leave whenever they want. They just have to get reelected every four years. But Washington, Washington kind of puts the kibosh on that. And he writes this beautiful farewell address. Um, and again, the YouTube link at the top is a, um, <laughs> is a Hamilton song that's a beautiful uh, rendition of Washington's farewell address with actually using part of the primary source document. So within his Washington's farewell address, he um, talks about domestic issues mostly, two-thirds of his domestic relations. He says, uh, avoid political parties. We don't want partisan fighting. We don't want bitterness, so just don't do it. Don't create permanent foreign alliances like a treaty with France. Just keep to yourselves for this period while we're still becoming a sovereign nation. Um, he also says that, th I mean, that is a form of isolationism, and that is going to dominate foreign policy for quite some time. Not just because of Washington, just because everyone in the country knows that we need to focus on ourselves during this time period. And so Washington had actually set a lot of precedents for our country. Um, presidents from starting during his time and even now rely a lot on department heads for advice and consent. And um, they talk a lot with their cabinet and draw a lot of information from their cabinet. That's not in the Constitution. Um, the president has the power to create his own his own cabinet and um, appoint department heads. Two terms for president is um, a precedent that he sets. And um, after John Jay resigns, essentially, um, this is going to go outside the Supreme Court to select a new chief justice for um, the Supreme Court. And that was another um, Washington kind of uh, precedent that he set. So the election of 1796 is kind of going to be one of our first, this is how it's actually going to be presidential elections. John Adams is going to be the Federalist candidate. Um, he's from Massachusetts. He's experienced in government. Hamilton was just too unpopular to run and knew it, um, that he would not be considered a serious candidate. And the Democratic Republicans put forth Thomas Jefferson, and he will run as well. Um, essentially, Thomas Jefferson is running on... Um, how brutal the Whiskey Rebellion crushing was, and Jay's Treaty was a big failure, and vote for me, states' rights, those sort of things. But Adams is going to defeat Jefferson 71 votes to Jefferson's 66 votes in the Electoral College. But um, at this point in history, the loser becomes the vice president. So Adams wins a Federalist, but the... Um, Vice President is going to be in direct opposition to him, Thomas Jefferson, a Democratic Republic. That will change 
next presidency cycle. So we're going to see John Adams have one very tumultuous, mostly awful term in the presidency, um, and Jefferson will be elected next. But first, let's focus on Adams' um, four years as president. So the French Directory government, um, while we're having this huge French Revolution and they're also at war with Great Britain, is furious that America made this treaty with um, with England. And so they see that as an affront to the Franco-American alliance. They see it as America trying to establish an Anglo, an English-American alliance. And so the French ministers tell French warships to begin seizing U.S. merchant vessels, and about 300 of them are going to be seized by the 1797. Um, so they're upset that Seemingly, America is going back on their friendship in trying to make a friendship with Great Britain. And so John Adams, during his administration, tries to alleviate this issue with, a, with what is now known as the XYZ Affair. So President Adams sends a delegation to Paris in 1797. It includes John Marshall and some other important people. And they're secretly approached by three ministers um, who call themselves X, Y, and Z, like he shall not be named sort of secrecy. Um, and they say, you need to pay us 25, I'm sorry, $250,000 just to talk to Minister Talleyrand, the um, foreign ambassador, the foreign minister, not even to actually negotiate the end of this um, French madness on the high seas of stealing American ships. And so seeing this as a bribe, um, John Marshall says, heck no and goes home, and he's welcomed home as a hero. And we see this hysteria sweep through the United States of, let's go to war with French. They really hurt our feelings. They truly um, insulted us with this idea of, you have to pay to talk to our foreign minister. And that's what's called the XYZ affair. So during this time, we get what some historians like to call the quasi-war. Quasi is like kind of, um, the kind of war, the quasi-war. And so um, knowing that this is happening on the high seas and French um, warships are seizing American merchant ships, they call for war preparations set in motion. The Navy Department at the cabinet level was created. Um, the, the Navy was originally just three ships, and that's going to be expanded upon during this time period. The Marine Corps is going to be established. Um, they stop all trade with, Fr with France. An army of 10,000 men was authorized. Washington and Hamilton were going to be in charge of it. It's not really actually raised and comes to fruition. Um, and they, American ship captains are told, you can go and capture um, French vessels if you want to. There's going to be a few naval bat battles in the um, French West Indies and kidnapping of men. And so these undeclared hostilities go on for two and a half years from 1798 to 1800, um, mostly in the West Indies, but also in the Atlantic Ocean. Um, around France and on trade routes from France to the United States. Um, U.S. privateers and the Navy captured over 80 French vessels. Um, a bunch of merchantmen are lost to the French as well as their stuff. And this full-blown war could break out if Adams doesn't do something to stop it. So what he, um, <laughs> what he is, the finest moment of the Adams administration is the convention of 1800. This is kind of the only good thing that Adams gets accomplished during his time period as presidency. So um, Talleyrand, the foreign minister, actually becomes eager to negotiate a peace because the U.S. is super hitting them hard with a trade embargo, not buying any of their goods and also stealing their ships on the high seas and dumping their cargo. Um, so... Adams essentially starts creating these negotiations, um, and what will come about from this is the end of the Franco, the 22-year Franco-American alliance with the U.S. The U.S. agrees to pay all the damages, all the money that they owe um, that the U.S. shippers had caused the French, and the French do the same as well. And so we get this peacetime um, military alliance of the Franco-American alliance is ended, but war is averted. So that's why it's seen as a success. 
So Hamilton and the Federalists are just enraged by this. They don't want peace. They want military glory against France um, because of the major insult dealt with the XYZ affair, whereas the Jeffersonians, Democratic Republicans, they um, wanted this one last try for peace with French because they are pro-French. Adams feels this to be his finest achievement because he solved an issue diplomatically before it became war, um, and eventually this will set up later on, three years later, um, when Jefferson is president, for um, Napoleon to give the Louis to allow Louisiana and that territory, the Louisiana Purchase, to be purchased by the United States. If they had gone to war at this point, then we might not have half of our country because this peace allowed for the Louisiana Purchase later. So John Adams, um, essentially the Convention of 1800, it's his finest moment. He goes back to sinking right after that. So um, the Alien and Sedition Acts were passed in 1798, um, a, two years before he would leave office. Um, and essentially the purpose of it is oppressive laws that reduce the power of Jeffersonians and silence anti-war opposition and anti-federalist opposition. So here are the two um, components of the Alien and Sedition Acts. On the left we have the Alien Acts, and this is the attack on pro-Jeffersonian aliens. So when immigrants come to the country, the um, they're oftentimes not wealthy and thus are welcomed by the Democratic Republican Party. So most of them will become Jeffersonians. So the Alien Act um, targets that political party by raising the resident requirement um, to be a United States citizen and thus to vote from five years living in the country to 14 years living in the country and also gives the president more power to deport dangerous foreigners in times of peace or to um, fine them or imprison them in times of hostility for little to no reason at all. Now this is not really in force, it's just for show, but essentially um, it frightened a lot of Jeffersonians into thinking He's trying to kill off our political party. On the right side, we have the Sedition Acts. The Sedition Acts um, are said that, let me quote it here, anyone who impedes the policies of government or falsely defame its officials, including the president, would be liable to a heavy fine and imprisonment. It is a direct threatening to First Amendment rights of um, freedom of the press, freedom of petition, and freedom of speech. So anyone who... Um, makes claims about the government in power, the Federalist Party, um, is liable to be imprisoned or fined for what they say or print. And so this is directly attacking the Democratic Republicans who are openly saying things and openly printing things that are anti-John Adams. Um, and so actually many outspoken um, Democratic Republican editors are indicted, 10 are brought to trial and convicted and have to pay heavy fines and um, serve jail time. But here's what's really petty about it. This law expires in 1801, the day before Adams leaves office. So he literally created this law so people can't say bad things about him and his political party. And in case a Federalist is not elected next, in case it's a Democratic Republican, the law expires when he leaves office. And thus, the Democratic Republicans don't have this um, protection against them. And I know you're wondering, well, why doesn't the Supreme Court say this is unconstitutional? Because that's not a thing that exists yet. That's coming. Um, and so this is the support for the Alien and Sedition Acts were actually pretty significant. Federalists supported it, even though it sounds ridiculous to us, but um, the Alien and Sedition Acts are um, largely credited for adding a lot of Federalist victory in the 1798 congressional elections. So Thomas Jefferson and James Madison are not happy about this, especially because they ascribe to the Democratic Republican Party. So they write the Virginia and Kentucky resolutions secretly, um, like not under their name, but like everyone knows that it's them, it comes out later. And so the um, Kentucky and Virginia resolutions say that states can ignore or nullify federal laws if they the state deems it unconstitutional. And here's why that's a thing, or they think that that's a thing, because there's no judicial review. The Supreme Court has not been granted the power to um, view cases and say they're constitutional or unconstitutional. That's coming really soon. And so um, the Kentucky and Virginia resolutions are just this show of the division between Federalists and Democratic Rep 
Republicans, where Democratic Republicans are saying, we don't have to listen to you if it's unconstitutional, if we deem it unconstitutional. And so um, other states don't end up passing these resolutions, but they're essentially used as documents to rally behind, like, yeah, the federal government's just gone too far this time. Moving into the end of the Adams administration, the Revolution of 1800 is when Adams and Jefferson are going to run again, and um, essentially Jefferson's going to win, and we're going to learn why it's called a revolution. So the Federalist Party is weakening quite a bit. Um, they're split over the war with France, Alexander Hamilton, and the High Federalists. They want to go with war to war with France. So when Adams creates the Convention of 1800 and that whole peace treaty, they're not happy about it. Splits the Federalist Party in half. Adams kind of stinks, and so people don't like that. Many people side with Alexander Hamilton. They break the party down. The Alien and Sedition Acts are unpopular with some Federalists. Some Federalists they're very popular with, but others are not, and so that breaks the party down even further, causes people to leave the party, and um, they were preparing for this war with France and incurring a lot of debt in doing so, and when it doesn't happen, that kind of gives them a bad rap. So um, the Federalists are kind of mudslinging in their campaign as well, accusing Jefferson of being an atheist, he's actually a deist, um, of accusing Jefferson of robbing a widow and her children of their money um, through a trust fund. They accuse him of fathering um, mixed-race children by his own slaves, which was actually true, we're going to learn about that later. Um, but this mudslinging essentially doesn't work because Adams' administration was just so weak. So Jefferson is not only running against Adams, he's running against Aaron Burr, who was a political upstart um, from a rich family as well. Um, and so he, Jefferson automatically defeats Adams with electoral votes 73 to 65, but ties where Burr gets 73 electoral votes as well. So here's what happens. Um, this is unprecedented, of course. It's only like our second real election. And so the House of Representatives has to break the deadlock. Hamilton, within the House of Representatives, um, essentially sways a lot of votes towards Alexander Hamilton, um, towards Jefferson um, for a number of reasons. Um, and so essentially Jefferson will win with a few votes and he will become the third president of the United States. The significance and why we call it a revolution of 1800 is that it's a peaceful transfer of power between political parties from the Federalists to the Democratic Republicans and that this revolutionary idea that we can transfer power peacefully without having bloodshed, without having war. Um, and we'll learn why I have um, Except Hamilton on here. So, um, so let's talk about the Federalist legacy here because their party is going to die out here real soon within the first 10 years of the 1800s. So the Federalist Party had the highest con concentration of brains, talent and ability. Um, they had the money for education and thus were very well educated. It was an elite party. They built political and financial foundations for the United States government, the Bank of the United States, the idea of um, tariffs and excise taxes really added to the economy of the United States and we saw it rising during the Federalist era. Um, diplomats of the Federalist Party kept them out of war kept the country out of war um, with Great Britain and out of war with France, um, which was difficult waters to navigate when you are a country fighting to kind of make a reputation and a name for yourself. Um, they will defend their party quite well um, within the two-party system where they're bickering between the parties but still be able to um, like be a actual party with a real reputation um, and so what's going to happen to the Federalist Party, we're going to see, um, part of it is the War of 1812, but westward movement kind of dictated more common people. People move out west, they want more land, thus they're more egalitarian and equal. So this political party that's like really rich people and really elite people just doesn't sound so good to them. And that is where... Um, they're unwilling to adjust their ideas and their appeal to regular people. And most of America at this point, 90% of America are rural farmers. And so um, they're just going to die in the sense that America is growing beyond the idea of the aristocrats and the elite. All right, thanks for watching. If you have any questions and or if you want to talk about the musical Hamilton, I would be happy to oblige that. Um, thank you guys very much.